I'm Paul Alexander. I direct the Institute on the Common Good here at Regis, and on behalf of the university and, and Father President, um, I give you a warm, a warm welcome. You know, the, one of the reasons we wanted John Paul Lederach to come here is because he reflects so closely the ideals and the vision of what the Institute's about and also what Regis is about. Um, uh, actually, TJ uh, forwarded me in an article the other day um, that John Paul wrote right after 9-11. It was right after the, it felt like it was right after the towers, um, the planes hit the towers. And, and, th and this just want to quote this. Uh, you'll hear a lot of him tonight, but I just think this, this was really powerful to me. Um, he said, our global challenge is how to generate and sustain genuine engagement that encourages people from within their traditions to seek that which assures the preciousness and respect for life that every religion sees as an inherent right and gift from the divine, and how to build organized political and social life that is responsive to fundamental human needs. Such a web cannot be created except through genuine and sustained dialogue in the building of authentic relationships. And I read that, and that just speaks to what the Institute was about. Uh, Father Sheeran created it about eight years exactly for that purpose, to bring people together from all walks of life, um, to build trust, to work together, to build peace, to, to really work for the common good. Um, and, it's, and it's through relationships and, and long, sustained conversations. So, um, you know, I, I think, and, and of course you've been doing that all your life, so to... Um, have him here is really quite powerful. Um, the Institute is, itself has done some, some dialogue work in, around Iraq and, and immigration and education and racism uh, in the community and uh, we, we take a lot um, from what we do from, um, from John Paul so it's really great to, to have you here. Um, and there's some brochures about the Institute. If you actually have some, uh, some work in the community that you'd like some good facilitation for, please, uh, please call us. Um, it's also really, I think, highly appropriate that he comes today because, uh, as many of you know, today is the feast day of Saint John, uh, um, of Francis of Assisi. And you know, if if, if you could think of anybody that um, you know whose life and works really calls us into right relationship with each other and with creation, it's uh, it's you know Saint Francis. And so, I was reading his canticle of all creatures today, and and this is what he's saying: um, you know, blessed are those who endure in peace. By you, Most High, they will be crowned. So even though you're a Mennonite, I can see, you know, God crowning you with this, this, this wonderful peace thing. So um, the very appropriate for the Catholic, maybe not so much for the Mennonite, but, uh, but we see, I will envision you crowned because of your, your great work through peace. So um, he also actually has a, another great tradition here because uh, John Paul uh, um, has, uh, in, is very similar to, to uh, President Clinton and Cardinal Mahoney because like him, uh, like them, he was one of the ones who really actually said he couldn't come and he just couldn't squeeze us in this year. But we had uh, someone that was able to convince him to come because um, he's traveling so much. So I think Nan uh, uh, Burnett, who uh, is uh, really, uh, really was able to, to have you come, and I really appreciate your squeezing us in. So welcome. So let me just tell you just a little bit about him, and then we'll pass it on to him. John Paul is widely known for his pioneering work on conflict transformation. He's involved in conciliation work in Colombia, the Philippines, Nepal, and Tajikistan, plus many countries in East and West Africa. He's helped design and conduct training programs in 25 countries across five continents. He was born in Indiana and grew up as, I love this, the Mennonite PK, I guess that's great, Pe preacher's kid, and so he spent a lot of time in Oregon and Kansas, so he's kind of a western boy, I think, in some ways. Um, he's held various posts at the, at the Mennonite Central Committee, um, and, and that uh, is, a, is a Quaker. That's one of the things that uh, we have always turned to, the great work of the Mennonite Central Committee. And I don't know if you know, but our president, Father Sheeran, uh, wrote sort of the seminal book on Quaker uh, process, um, and he's, he, all the Quakers bring him around to, to talk about how to, you know, how to engage in this. And so that was his dissertation, so uh, one of your fellow peace churches, anyway. Since 2001, he's been a professor of international peace building at the Joan B. Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at Notre Dame, and also a distinguished scholar, uh, um, scholar for the Eastern Mennonite University, where, uh, oh, I don't know how many, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you created the, the Conflict Transformation Program in the Institute for Peace Building, 15 years ago, and that's one of the, the great programs as well. So we started two of the, really the primo, next to, of course, our Peace and Justice Program, Byron, um, of uh, uh, 
So next to yours, he's created the two best in the country. So um, He's also, uh, the, you know, the other thing, I just have to say, he does this all from Rollinsville, Colorado, which just uh, boggles my mind that he can actually travel all around the world and, and uh, teach in all these different places and, and be, a, be a homeboy. So we appreciate that. So He's an author of many books, and uh, including The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace, and that's kind of the title for his talk tonight. So we're quite grateful and quite pleased to have John Paul Lederach with us tonight. I'm going to try this uh, roving mic, so if you can hear me all right, I'll feel a little more comfortable being here than behind there. Uh, I've come tonight to speak absolutely straight from my heart, from things that I've been involved in. Uh, those of you that are over there, uh, if you can rotate more this way, I won't have to turn so far to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to base most of this on a recent book, so if you have interest in some of the stories and or reflections that I'm bringing you, it's found in The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace. It's been out for about a year and a half. That book was, it, to some degree, the result of a personal professional crisis. And so if honesty speaks, let me speak honestly. It started after 25 years of work, looking back across many places where I had been, had been engaged, had been doing what I thought was significant work. And when I looked carefully at the things that appeared to have the most incredible sorts of transformational moments, they didn't appear to have much to do with me. Um, that doesn't create the full professional crisis. What creates it is, I think, a sense of both locating yourself, but also taking the time to notice things that make a difference and how they have made that difference. So the book actually starts with a very simple question. And the question is, how exactly have people in some of the settings that have been the deepest and hardest hit by cycles of repeated violence, not over a year or two, but over decades and sometimes generations, how have people in especially local communities at moments where it was least expected, found ways to actually create an enormous impact on their particular community that had echoes out into the wider situation. How did they transcend these cycles of violence while still living in them? This, of course, I think is one of the hardest questions to answer. We often look back, especially in the field of peace studies, we look back at the histories of particular locations. And we try to find and locate the things that give us the indicators of how it was that a war ended, or how it was that a particular negotiation functioned well. And most of that is looking back, after the fact. This is not the luxury that people who live in the midst of violence have. They must somehow find ways of responding while it's still continuing to happen with little capacity to know whether what they do or say or the steps they take will in fact translate into the change that they hope for. I chose for the book four stories of people that I've worked with. I'd like to bring you three of those tonight. Um, and I'd like to do it in more of a storytelling mode. My, my daughter Angie, who is now 23 years old, uh, when she was about six, I was invited to uh, preach at a Mennonite church where we were living at that time in Virginia. Uh, I don't preach that often, so it's a bit of a rare occasion when early Sunday morning she sees me trying to figure out what to say before my own home congregation. And so she came out to breakfast and said, Dad, what are you, what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm supposed to preach. Said, what are you going to preach about? And I said, well, I don't know. I thought I would just maybe uh, tell some stories and then, and then make a few points about them. And she said, without a blink of her eye, <laughs> 